It's twelve thirty-three, Stephen. I reckon we should uh, we should uh, yeah. crack on. We're getting a lot of people joining, and uh, uh, I'm a bit of a stickler for time time myself. Um, so I'll just say hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, great to see everybody uh, on this wonderful afternoon. Um, I'm Neil Austin. I'm vice president of real estate at Omnicom Group, and I'm also the current chair of the New York chapter of um, Cornet. So thanks very much for registering for this. Uh, Plan to be great event uh, called Corporate Culture. Uh, I'm sure it's very topical and interesting for you and your company. It's certainly uh, very relevant for what I'm doing with my company all around the world at the moment. Um, as you're well aware, it is another online virtual event. Um, and obviously, we've become very familiar with these over the last year. But I can, can confirm that as a chapter, we are definitely looking at working towards bringing in-person events and meetups to you as soon as practical, because I know that's something we all would love to do. Uh, I can't wait to get learning and networking again face-to-face. -face. It's, uh, it's so important uh, to why we're involved with this. Um, but it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Stephen now, who will go through the housekeeping rules and introduce the great panel that we have lined up for you today. So over to you, Stephen, and uh, here's to a great event. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. So welcome everyone to today's panel titled Corporate Culture, where our panelists are going to talk to how to leverage talent and technology to drive culture in a post-pandemic, more decentralized world. I'm Stephen Coulthard. I'm part of the senior management group at Cumming Corporation and chair of Cornet New York Chapters Strategy and Portfolio Planning Committee, where we focus on issues that corporate real estate leaders need to know to talk to their businesses. Today's call will follow our usual 30 minute format, um, sorry, usual format with a 30 minute panel conversation followed by a 20 minute Q&A. To allow the Q&A to be interactive, we do not control your audio and video. So during the panel, please switch both of them off and keep the questions coming through the chat. When we get to the Q&A, Tom, our moderator, will call out individuals to turn on their audio and video and ask the questions they raised in the chat during the panel. Today's panel expands on a recent well-attended and successful coffee chat to discuss further how organizations need to evolve from a talent and technology perspective to work in a more virtual ecosystem that balances office and remote working. Our panelists today are Brian Berthold, Global Lead of Workplace Experience at Cushman and Wakefield, who created the Experience Per Square Foot Experience Diagnostic Platform. Chris Jackson, Senior Director of Global Workplace Solutions and New York HQ Transformation at Pfizer Digital. Pfizer, I read this morning, have been catapulted to number seven in the Harris Poll of the most trusted and reputable companies in America. And finally, our moderator, Tom Bradbury, CEO of Helix2 and author of The Culture Project, 30 Days to Reboot Your Organization. And with that, I will hand over to Tom. Enjoy the panel. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Coordinate New York, for this opportunity to um, talk together and have an interactive Q&A after Brian, KJ, and myself um, have, have a- So how do we, do we need an engineer to essentially do that as Okay, we're back. Yes, we need an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> we need an engineer. We've got it. So again, my name is Tom Bradbury. I'm CEO of Helix2, an advisory firm that focuses on um, align, helping organizations aligning their talent in tech. I also, as Stephen alluded to, um, I'm the author of The Culture Project, 30 Days to Reboot Your Organization. And the methodology that I present in my book and in my work with clientele is really based on the thesis that if you focus on talent and technology together um, in a way to improve productivity, employee engagement, and overall ROI, that you will indeed have a very profound impact on the culture of any given organization. And that's what we're, we're really here to talk about today. And um, as Stephen said, I'm joined by my um, often collaborator over the past several years, Brian Berthold um, from Cushman and Wakefield, um, who uh, our work together has been important for both of our roles and our you know, approach to our work and was foundational in forming my thesis that in how I work with clients. And also joining us is Chris K.J. Jackson, 
Um, some, you know, KJ is a stakeholder at um, Earl, from very early on in the process to inform what turned into um, a, a large, exciting design and construction project. And early on, there were um, the initial internal activities uh, where Brian and I met and collaborated with KJ in around this very area and trying to understand what the experience currently and maybe perhaps um, more of a desired state, you know, how the employee's perspective should be considered and leveraged by leadership and the team when they get to the design and construction process, which they did indeed get to. So that's really some of what the comment, uh, uh, the context will be what you hear about today is that the work we did together that set the stage, you know, within those internal activities out of the gate, but set the stage for the workplace in, um, design and construction project that ensued. And really what I would um, offer you guys to take note of is just, um, you know, Obviously, we'll, Brian was going to talk, but then for me, a big highlight is hearing uh, KJ talk about how leadership got behind, right? They weren't just sponsors. They were drivers to this and noted that, um, you know, taking the work we did early on and saying, you know, let's look at tech and talent together to drive culture. And that's the exciting kind of um, premise that I think everyone should be paying attention to. Uh, when, when uh, Brian talks also, but uh, when, when KJ describes uh, their project. And, and what you'll hear and find is not only did it inform, was it, a, did it bring about a well-informed design and construction project, but it also had a very positive impact on their positioning to deal with the pandemic. So now I'm gonna st um, start by handing it over to Brian, um, who will talk about um, the, some of the things we learned and did with KJ early on um, in that work. Brian? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, and Pfizer was a, a, a great client, um, opened our eyes to a lot of things that um, when we started digging into the details on how things were going um, for them, what we found is they were actually a very productive company. Um, and yet they felt there was something missing, something wrong, and something they could be doing better. And um, I'll uh, show you some information around what we found and what we did through our discovery. Um, in running our experience diagnostic, our experience for square foot, um, what we found is off the chart, if you look at the Pentag uh, Pentagon, the line is uh, kind of average scores around five key categories when we look and diagnose and experience. So you have up at uh, 12 o'clock, your ability to focus and feel productive, um, uh, going around clockwise. Uh, do you feel as a team you're collaborating well? Then are you bonding as a group? Um, are you renewed and energized through your day? And are you learning continuously um, both as an individual and as a team? And as you'll see here, the shaded areas are their scores. So. As it proved out, and we've seen this in focus groups and many things that, um, yeah, th they were getting the job done and they were teaming. Um, but everything else, uh, they weren't, the bonding was very challenging. Their work environment uh, was not conducive to finding people, um, coordinating meetings, knowing where things are. Um, people um, had almost given up learning because they're too busy getting the stuff done and trying to figure it out. And what I found discouraging is, hey, um, the overall theme was we're doing great things. We're getting things done despite the work environment. Um, not exactly a, a model that you wanted to see um, a, as a banner over your real estate group. Um, but the reality is because of the cumbersome nature to find space, um, technology not necessarily enabling them, we watched the behaviors that came about um, as a result. Um, for example, um, managers were getting together every morning to kind of check in. So they kind of have a huddle, kind of a scrum, not because they needed to, but because it was so kludgy to try to coordinate with each other, they just decided let's meet in person, figure out what we need to do, check in, um, 
because the technology in the space wouldn't allow us to do that throughout the day. Um, as a result, they were spending a lot more time in meetings, a lot more time just on the logistics of getting their work done that um, they were exhausted, putting in a lot more hours. And the renew score there, um, you see 64% of people feeling somewhat energized um, was one of the lowest that we've seen um, and, and a growing concern. So we knew at that point, um, and here's more details around Hey, what are those things that um, are all contributing to the work environment and their experience? And you'll see a lot of this was, uh, hey, we know things that are working well, um, some of the tools and the things that allow us to focus in team, but there are a lot of areas of opportunity around bringing people together, better collaborative technology and spaces, and really finding ways for this um, company to move kind of from individual contributor to a community and collaborative practice. On the technology side, um, and Tom and I partnered with them to kind of work through um, what Helix2 has uh, called workplace user experience, workplace UX, is it studies six areas um, uh, for, for the company. And this isn't talking about your tools, this is actually getting into, well, how do you meet? How do you focus on getting work done? How do you in, inspire people and how do you take care of them? Um, and through that, we, we found, hey, where are the areas of improvement? Where are the, the actual things that are getting in their way day to day? And you can see under these categories, um, the things that, you know, how they meet in the meeting spaces, conference, hotel rooms, boardrooms were inconsistent in their application and their use of technology uh, and very hard to schedule. Um, and then you just move through the, the other areas. They weren't leveraging technology to a great extent to communicate what's going on and keep the teams um, engaged. You know, it was primary, primarily an email culture. And at the end of the day, if things are broken, where do I get support? How do I connect? How do I find things? Um, a lot of that support and training was mediocre, but um, just very hard, um, you know, day to day. And one of the things that it led us to in development was actually thinking about this through the user experience and the user lens, not based on um, the tools and technology. And this is where KJ's work with us um, at the time was very inspirational because we started looking at these kinds of categories that the overall experience has to do with a much more mobile workforce. So what is the mobile working experience? What are the things that contribute to that? And how does technology become an enabler for the journey of the typical Pfizer employee? Um, the collaborative experience, realizing that um, it was not uh, a smooth um, collaborative experience if you were not in the building or even connecting between sites. And we needed a way for uh, people to be able to connect anywhere they, they are. Um, and I noticed when I was there, a lot of people would commute long distances to get to headquarters to be in a via, um, you know, important meeting because they couldn't rely on the connection uh, on the outside. Um, so it, it drove a lot of behaviors and maybe people that thought they could do this more remote um, weren't afforded that opportunity. The information was interesting because uh, KJ had so many opportunities to have uh, kind of point of touch around the, the places using digital um, technology and other vehicles besides email blasts to kind of um, get people used to digital communication in, in a way of having an experience that really keeps them informed on the company, their group, uh, what's going on so that people felt more part of the fabric of the company. And then lastly, creating a, a support experience, setting up kind of the uh, geek squad hub where people can come and do break fix things. Um, you're having an easy experience if you're having trouble connecting to uh, your technology in a room or an outside party. Um, how do we bring those things to the fingertips of people as a smooth transition versus I forgot the phone number, what do I do now? Um, 
but really was it was eye opening, and I think it really set the stage. And KJ will um, I'll, I'll transition to you, um, and you could tell me this this is kind of what led up to their planning efforts um, a few years ago. But I think it's really um, you know if we had known the pandemic was coming, these are the steps we would have taken anyway. Yeah, exactly, Brian. First of all, thanks for having me, everybody. I'm happy to talk about this subject. Hard to believe this work that we're looking at was from uh, three plus years ago. We talked to 115 Pfizer colleagues over 13 different sessions. Three common themes came out. Uh, first of all, collaborating in the office was important to everyone, but extremely difficult. Too much time spent trying to figure out how to start a meeting, have a meeting, where to go, book a room, et cetera. Secondly, communication is key. Uh, they thought our digital organization did it pretty well, however, could be vastly improved, and we needed to declare the tools. There were a lot of tools that colleagues were using, um, many of them duplicative of each other, and they wanted us to declare the appropriate tools for the best experience. And thirdly, and actually the most important uh, piece of feedback we got is uh, what's under the hood determines the ride, as I like to say. Make sure you got the rock solid infrastructure, uh, you know, to deliver the experience that we are uh, hoping to deliver. Uh, the number one request was for solid Wi-Fi throughout our current headquarter. Everybody was complaining. It's a 60 plus year old building. It wasn't built to work the way we work today. And people complain about that all over. So a lot of work and a lot of thought in talking to people and getting their um, expressions, uh, concerns, their thoughts about the experience we want to drive in building and uh, developing our new headquarter. So that has led us to the definition of our digital experience design for 66 Hudson Boulevard. We are moving from the east side of Midtown Manhattan over to the west side in Hudson Yards. We will be the anchor tenant in a new build that is, uh, we've just started taking delivery of the Pfizer floors for interior construction. Our digital experience design is really focused in three key areas. We want this to be a smart building. We are um, entering for the first time into the use of sensors, uh, data analytics, and now POE lighting in a commercial site. We've done some of this in our manufacturing plants, but this is our first opportunity to introduce it to our commercial sites. We're very excited about that. We've also partnered with a vendor to provide a colleague companion mobile app, uh, giving people uh, access to lots of concierge services and information about the building, the surrounding area, how, how to behave, can you book a room, where can you go, what kind of meeting rooms are there, et cetera. So we're excited to deliver a mobile app that'll really benefit colleague in their experience in working in the building, but it'll also help tie them to collaborating outside of the building as well. And thirdly, really robust collaboration and engagement. Uh, make sure our video conferencing is rock solid. Uh, I'm happy to say we've landed on the Microsoft suite of collaboration tools. Um, we had started to implement the Teams uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, recently, as a result of the pandemic, have now gone, um, you know, full implementation across the entire population of Pfizer colleagues with Teams AV, and have experienced a wonderful collaboration experience while most of us are working remotely. And we are going to transition that back into the building with the creation of Microsoft Teams Rooms. Uh, so the behaviors, um, the way you will one click to attend a meeting uh, is going to be carried back into the new building. Additionally, this facility will have what I'm calling marquee moments of information delivery, communicating to colleagues, to visitors about Pfizer's purpose, our role as a healthcare company, uh, the great work we're doing, our researchers are doing. So there's a lot of great opportunities in this new space to um, continue to identify and educate colleagues and, and visitors as to all the great things Pfizer has to offer. And it's a, it's a really great opportunity, some really cool stuff. The space is going to be fantastic. We've created this concept of a hackable zone. There are four or five of them throughout the stack. And these are areas where the tech is embedded in uh, movable walls. And you can create an environment that is um, you know, conducive to however you'd like to work. So we're really, really excited about the uh, prospect of moving in. Uh, we are expected to occupy beginning November of next year. It's been a long road to get to where we are, but uh, I feel the next 18 months are going to go very fast and we'll be cutting that ribbon uh, sooner than I think we will. <laughs> so, but a great opportunity to work with Brian and Tom and get this the uh, consensus of our colleagues. And our leadership really uh, cared about how people 
felt in this whole process. We have stayed engaged with the colleagues. We do a town hall um, just about every other month uh, with the New York colleague base. It's about just under 3,000 people uh, talking about uh, what's coming, how they're going to be working. Um, we have, in fact, um, changed some policies now as a result of what we've all experienced over the last uh, year and a half. We now are going to allow colleagues to be very flexible with where they decide to work. We were able to quickly pivot to remote working um, during the pandemic, and thankfully, because we had the right technologies in place to allow us to do so, um, we didn't really skip a beat, uh, which is great. Um, and now we're starting to turn our attention on, okay, how do we bring people back into the office, and how do we maintain sort of the equity of access, if you will, for colleagues who might be working um, in the building in a conference room or a collaboration space, and connecting in with those that are still remote. So a lot of work going into how do we bring people back in a seamless way so they can continue to have a great uh, experience um, you know, that they've, they've had over the last 18 months. So uh, a lot of work being done in that regard. And um, again, talking to colleagues along the way to get their perspectives and uh, you know, happy to be here and tell you anything you wanna hear about our experiences. Thanks, KJ. Um... I, hey, Brian, I, I'd like to really um, focus in on something that I think maybe we we went through a little too quickly. Can you go back to the four pillars on the slide? Absolutely. <clears throat> and I, KJ, I'd like to kind of reminisce a little bit about this because, you know, on one hand, um, le the Pfizer leadership were great listeners, but it wasn't only that we sat and interviewed end users and had focus groups and you know took their complaint list and and marched into leadership's office right we you know as you recall kj you and i collaborated on some strategies on how we met with different folks within it in infrastructure or different areas within the overall it department to understand what they were doing and they were and and how they were doing it and really digging into the marching orders that they felt they were following from leadership whether it was budget or or some sort of experience that wasn't really aligned with the end user's perspective and the end user's reality and once we connected those in the report KJ I felt like we made a lot of progress in putting something together that made business sense to leadership, not just necessarily um, a list of complaints, right? That that we needed to address. Yeah, yeah, you you're absolutely right, Tom. It really underscored, um, you know, the importance of technology in the view of our colleagues, right? And how that was really going to, in many cases, make or break uh, their experience. And I'm I'm happy to tell you that we were we were highly sponsored and endorsed to do the things we want to do with this facility, and that has bled into our our new design strategies and workplace strategies and the purpose of Pfizer workplaces going forward. I'm happy to say we had this wonderful platform, a headquarter move, to do a lot of great discovery, uh, and as a as a result, Pfizer colleagues around the globe will start benefiting from a lot of the work that we've done, which is great. And I can't underscore that enough, right? Working with Pfizer, but with any client, right, is helping leadership understand the decisions that are being made and what the impacts are, right? In, yep. in, it's not only what you're doing, so often it's how you're doing it. And those perspectives of the end user, technology professionals who are experts delivering expert solutions and the leadership the more you can get those three perspectives aligned, the more you can have a profound impact on the tech talent induced culture. Yeah, I, we have some really great digital talent at Pfizer, um, but I see some of my friends and colleagues on the call today who would uh, probably appreciate the statement that we really had to do uh, a lot of educating with some of them to change their old school thinking uh, into developing this smart building concept and bringing uh, Pfizer into the new millennium with respect to how to manage a building uh, differently than we did in the past. And I'm happy to say that uh, uh, we've gotten there. A lot of our, our, our colleagues and our, our tech folks are really happy with the platforms that we're delivering and, and considering to deliver. And they've been really very supportive in the end. I, I like how you positioned it in that um, a lot of this work 
helped Pfizer react better, more productively to the pandemic. And, and I'll use that as a segue back to you, Brian. Um, you have an, another slide coming up with that really from your experience per square foot tool, um, where you went out over the past year plus and took a real look at what the impact of the pandemic was on, on end users. Yeah, and um, listening to you guys, I can't reinforce enough the difference of understanding you've got um, three different clients here. You've got the actual users, and they're the ones that have the experience and are productive or not, engaged or not. Um, and then that leadership um, key component, are they along, are they embracing this? And that's a key part of the whole change management, but kind of the secret sauce are those that actually build these things out and service it and take care of people. And I'll speak from a you know, lessons learned standpoint, um, rolling out a new workplace strategy. Um, this was at Capital One at the time where we rolled this out um, we had some new technology solutions and everything was great. Leadership embraced it. Um, so did the team, but we never informed the help desk and the community that was going to take care of this. So when break fix calls or things came on the new technology, they're like combing their manuals with, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, because we didn't think about it through the people that take care of this and maintain it on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, those kind of three triangle, you know, pronged approach of understanding experience from each of those is really important. Um, this is data of what we have found. So everything we are talking about has led up to the thinking that went into place uh, pre-pandemic. And now, you know, Chris is talking about how they're embracing some of the remote workers and things. But what actually did happen and what are the things that are material here? These are, um, we did a study over 60,000 people in 100 countries over the last 12 months. Um, and to show you, hey, what's the change that we anticipate? Um, first off, the, uh, like I said, Pfizer's focus and um, teaming productivity scores were high. Well, we did find that people are still working, 75% of people feeling they're productive. That has not changed from what it was pre pandemic, but there's a lot of scores that really dropped. So we're here talking about culture. Um, well, this 50% number are people feeling connected to each other today. That was 73% pre-COVID and now only half of us are feeling like we are socializing, we're bonding, we're connecting to culture, we're learning. Um, that's taken a big hit. Um, repeat clients who've taken our diagnostic are showing double digit drops in this area over time. So it's something to be concerned with. Um, one of my number one concerns is, I call it 2019 building collaborative technology meets 2020 Zoom technology. They don't work. <laughs> and, and KJ, I'd like to hear more on what you're doing to remedy that, but it's too late to figure these things out once everyone's back. That's a huge issue if you can't build a, a successful umbilical cord. Um, the second score, the 55% of people have a sense of well-being. That was 74% pre-COVID. Um, people are, you know, work-life blur. We're all stressed. We're all taxed. Um, and that continues to go down. Uh, recent surveys, what we have found is while productivity was maintained, we have noticed that on average, the amount of hours people are working had gone up significantly. So I don't think it's a qualitative measure to say productivity is maintained. I think people are having to work longer and harder to keep that pace. Um, and we've seen a lot of struggles and it, it speaks to why do we need to return to the office, but the younger you are, the more challenged you are um, uh, trying to work from home. And that can be kids home from school or working on the kitchen table or roommates buying for the one office, uh, a host of reasons. But overall, about four out of five, 78% of people saying, you know what, I think we need to work more flexibly, uh, more mobile, more distributed. Um, but what I see as probably the biggest change is the kind of focus heads down work is less viable, less a need in the office. The office is really that purveyor of experiences for bringing groups together and collaborating and innovating. 
and a lot of the technology that um, I've seen KJ develop and put into place is all around bringing people together, keeping them informed, making it easy to connect apps in your hands so that that experience coming in, you really can feel the culture, feel like a, a, a team that gels. And that's why you can't just go back to the workplace of a year ago um, if you're not in that place. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Brian. We, uh, you know, we, a small team was formed to look at transitioning back, right? And how do we, how do we pull forward some of the ideas we are going to be building into the new headquarter and deliver them in our current spaces? Um, you know, our our pivot, our move to Microsoft uh, Teams collaboration tools was fantastic. Uh, you know, it, it provides one click entry to a meeting. Um, we're going to introduce that in the rooms uh, where we can in our current headquarter and certainly throughout the building uh, at 66 Hudson Boulevard. But, um, you know, we, we have to look at our design a little bit differently. And how do we how do we provide a room setup that makes people feel engaged and included, regardless of whether they're actually in the room or they're remotely participating? So there's some slight changes to room design. I'm happy to say that we were really flexible in providing a multitude of space types for different types of working. Uh, you know, there's there's soft seating, there's what I would consider traditional conference table seating, there's movable furniture. So lots of opportunities for uh, working and meeting, uh, regardless of your scenario and, and what works best for you. Um, but it is, a, it is a, a thought of leadership to ensure that we maintain this sort of equity of access that we've all experienced because we're all on equal playing field working remotely from a commercial perspective anyway. Certainly a different story for our manufacturing and research colleagues, but we're talking about administrative type people across the board. Um, they're very concerned that we uh, provide a great experience upon going back to the office here in the coming months. Thanks, KJ. So Brian, what? Um... When we look at this data on um, what um, experience per square foot has um, uh, helped us understand through the pandemic, how do we see moving forward? Yeah, there's um, some interesting insights that, uh, you know, what to do, what not to do, and the things we still need to work on. Um, one of the key things that we've identified is people really enjoy the flexibility and recognizing the work I do at home is not the same as the work I would do in the office. So I'm coming together to be with my, my team when I go into the office. I didn't go in necessarily, some will, but most are not going in to just do heads down work all day. They could stay home because they found out over this last year, I can still do that. Um, but what I've recognized is some clients are getting heavy into scheduling and worried about, hey, you know, KJ, you come in Tuesday, Thursday, or Tom, you come in Monday, Wednesday, that type of behavior. But recognizing that work is different when you come in versus home means my calendar, my schedule, when I want to brainstorm with my team, when I want to crunch something out, doesn't necessarily align to a calendar that you create for me. Um, and we see in experience scores <clears throat> at a 75, 80% of people having a great experience when you let them choose when to come in. Um, but the minute you try to calendarize that and schedule it, it drops into the 40s. So it's something that, to be concerned with. You wanna keep um, the freedom of moving back and forth uh, possible. The other thing I will, I will um, share, and in, in, uh, Tom and I are working on this with um, uh, a couple of clients right now is about what he and I are calling this cultural opportunity zone, um, that the learnings that we have from our experience for square foot of really recognizing that there's so much that is relying on the, the talent, their experience and the technology, that getting that right, we really have this opportunity between now and when everyone comes back to make these key steps. Some of them will be bold moves that need leadership guidance um, we kind of looked at it in our own brainstorming of um, my, our worries are what's going to happen on the bottom. Um, and I'm worried too, everyone, you know, the news with masks off, uh, if you've been vaccinated. And uh, I got a call later the same day when that came out with the CEO of one company that said, all right, I'm telling my people, everyone back um, by July 1. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> 
everything that KJ is talking about on technology and solutions aren't necessarily in place <clears throat> for every company. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get into this break fix mode of you rush to get people back. Um, those tactical talent and tech decisions are going to be trying to fix situations. And that's where your resources will be spending time. Hey, we can't get the audio connected to outside. We can't, you know, the, the people's faces on the screen are blocking the presentation, whatever it is. Um, and to me, that's just gonna further erode your culture and your effectiveness. Um, and I've, I've had some clients who have literally been in a meeting and opted to go to their seat to join the Zoom call because that was so much easier. And that's not success. So I think there's this real opportunity um, in the top line about really understanding what's that experience, um, like what KJ did with us on what we want people to feel and experience throughout their day, leveraging um, tech, and then set up your policies and culture and get leadership engaged in that process so that all the chess moves you make are all you know, pointing at the, at the North Star where you want to be and not get, and get out of this break fix, so. And I think, um, I was just gonna say, you know, the path that Pfizer chose is much more aligned with this more positive trajectory on the top half of this slide, right? They were thinking about, you know, they got leadership invested in the process to listen and understand, coordinate the, the requirements better um, with IT and help develop a roadmap that offered flexibility. And that's really, um, that, that's really what we're talking here. When we say there's a culture opportunity zone, I look at it with, with the clients that I'm currently working with. My job is to help them um, set up very flexible parameters so that when they get back to the office and then the 6, 12, 24 months after that, they're going to be, leadership is going to be cutting, or excuse me, measuring a few times before they cut every time they go in to advance their policy around work, right, and the workplace. So I see it as my job to help keep a wide berth to let them evolve over those next 24 months. You know, there's, there's, there could be a big overcorrection going on. Maybe there, in some ways there is an undercorrection. It depends on each individual business, each vertical, um, in, in what their needs are as an organization. But um, by and large, what I see out there is that um, leadership is cautious to just go and make wholesale changes for the sake of making them. So they're being more conservative. So helping them make great decisions around tech and talent and the policies that they put in place, um, help them um, maintain flexibility so that those policies can advance and evolve so that they can continue to find the talent they want to help their business succeed. So, so Tom, I'm, I'm happy to say that we were making the right technology choices pre-COVID, right? We were, we were really thinking ahead about how we wanted to evolve the Pfizer technology experience, the digital experience. And so that's, that teed us up really well from a technology perspective. Um, we recognize there are some things that will have to change, albeit not whole scale. Our, our platforms will, will pretty much remain the same. Um, and uh, to bring people back to the office, we're looking at things like, you know, new camera technologies, for example, that do better speaker tracking and, and give you that sense of, you know, being in the room if you're not kind of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, we are... Uh, we're cautiously optimistic that we're going to go back into the office. Um, we're going to wait and see, right, how it goes in the coming months. We're not telling people to rush back if you don't want to. We've instituted this flexible work scheduling policy. It's called log in for your day, work from home a few days, come in a few days, whatever works for you to be most productive is what they're allowing for. Um, KJ, and, yeah, can I ahead. just ask you, as I recall in our work, um, you guys had a fairly progressive or at, at least in place remote working um, culture where there were, uh, I seem to recall that that was, that there was a semblance of a decent policy in place in and around that. Is that accurate? That is correct. Um, albeit not as, uh, 
not as stated or specific to the policy as it is now. Right. Um, and we've repositioned the purpose of our workplaces moving forward because we want them to be the places where you go to collaborate, to innovate, to be together with a sense of community, not necessarily to have to go there for a heads down focused work. That's not to say it's not there to accommodate the people that do prefer leaving their home environment because it isn't conducive to working as we've seen a lot of folks in that situation through COVID. So there is certainly the opportunity for people to continue to go in the office and do focused work. But we're really shifting the purpose of the Pfizer workplace to being more about community collaboration, innovation. Yeah. And you bring up an ex a very interesting point about you know, some of the things you're reevaluating the camera technology and whatnot, which was influenced by getting everyone back. And yeah. I think what's really important, and this goes back to the concept of the culture opportunity zone, right? Have some flexibility and then evolve as, as the technology supports that in that, you know, we all knew that you can work together and collaborate in the office, right? The one thing that the pandemic has shown everybody is that you can all be on the same platform and collaborate and be productive when everybody is remote, right? So what's really going to be interesting and exciting is to see, there's not going to be an answer for some in, some out, like the hybrid. There's not going to be perfect answers for that, you know, like right. day one even probably into you know September. I know companies like Zoom and Microsoft are really working hard to try to um, you know, uh, evolve their technologies to better provide for a, that hybrid experience. Because, but, but the reality is that's just not there yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you find that, that, that that's part of why you guys are looking at the, the, the camera technology and some of the other yeah, yeah, I think I think you're right, Tom. I think um, you know we've been discussing. I've, I've part of this small work group just in the last couple of weeks. We're really now trying to focus on behaviors, right? And what behavioral change do we need people to undertake in order to be successful, right? In this new hybrid model, there's a lot of functionality in the tools that have been delivered over the last two years that people aren't aware of and they don't understand. And so we really want to educate to exploit. You know, how do you how do you um, treat people fairly in a remote situation uh, using the tools. Raise your hand to ask a question. Send a little happy emoji if you're expressing joy about a comment, things like that. Let's get people to understand how to, how to behave using the new technologies as opposed to thinking we need to whole scale uh, you know, switch the technologies, right? Yeah, there's, there's something there I think is really important because I always get asked, hey, what should we be doing in our work environment? Uh, what's everyone else doing? And I always joke, well, what everyone else is doing is asking me what everyone else is doing because we haven't done it yet. But um, for most clients, I'm saying don't waste your capital on redesigning your layouts and space. I think right now it's the change management, people, education, training component, and the technologies that um, are hyper-focused and sensitive and using um, the period between now and when people return to get that right. Make sure, and, and you have to think about people from the standpoint of the reason it's working smoothly right now is everything I do is on my laptop, everything. My presentation, my phone call, my meetings, my brainstorming, the deck I wrote in one place. The minute I come to the building, I have to interact with it and engage with meeting rooms and schedulers and things and I have to use an app to connect because it's not all in my laptop. And if you're, if you're changing it all, they're not coming back to what they're used to. Uh, like I had a simple yep. thing, I went back to yep. my office and they swapped out all the copy machines with new technology. Uh, all of a sudden I went in to hit print, nothing worked, nobody told me. I was like, oh, uh, well imagine that 10X if you've got reservation systems and all these protocols and new stuff, uh, that's a lot of change. Um, having leadership kind of communicate the message and people taking the time before they come in to learn this stuff, they'll see it's all for the better. So. One of the things we're talking a lot about is how can people identify what their status is? Are they working remotely or are they, are they you know, in the office? And so there's a way to set your status in Teams or um, you know, in the Microsoft tools. 
Um, but you should do that more regularly as opposed to just maybe when you're going on vacation or whatever. Now it's about establish the norm where you need to be identifying what your work status is. We're also looking into, is there a way in our reservation system when we accept a meeting to accept it uh, with a location? I'll be remote, I'm accepting remotely, or I'll be accepting in my home location, or I'll be accepting at another Pfizer location. So we're looking at, can we modify the tools to accommodate that? Because that alone will really help the, the continued feeling included, feeling connected, uh, if you really have a sense where everybody is. So those are some of the things we're looking at uh, as we get ready to go back to the office, hopefully um, in the September timeframe. Great, thanks, KJ. Yeah. Let's uh, flip it to Q&A. The first question from someone who is uh, so, someone who's here on the call with us, I would ask um, Raj Virani of Marsh McLennan, if you could um, put your audio and video on and, and, and ask away. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you all. It's been a really excellent conversation. Um, here, here at Marsh McLennan, we're um, partway through our own uh, headquarter renovation project. It was a four-phase project. And, uh, COVID kind of hit us right at the end of phase one and into phase two. But uh, so this is very interesting to hear of the Pfizer experience. So um, my question is about, um, you know, it sounds like your plans have been very robust since the start. It's uh, you're thinking about technology and remote working and all, all, all this excellent thing, all these excellent things. Um, what are people's expectations, either leaders or colleagues about Hey, did you really have it all figured out before COVID? And you know, you're just continuing down the same path. And don't worry, trust us, it'll be great. Or is there skepticism that you're kind of dealing with, both at like a senior leadership level, or uh, you know, actually from the ground up from colleagues? Um, you've answered parts of that, so I don't want, yeah. don't necessarily need to repeat that, but. Um, yeah, just kind of any thoughts around that would be helpful. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, I think there is skepticism. I do think that um, not from leadership. Uh, we've we've had great sponsorship from the beginning with respect to the design of the building, the plan for the technology, the digital experience that we have laid out for colleagues. Um, really great sponsorship and support from day one. And we really did try to push the envelope um, as much as we could to deliver the best experience. But yeah, there's there's some question as to, well, gosh, you really figured it all out and you're not changing anything as a result of what we've gone through over the last 18 months. Our leadership will tell you, the program leadership will say, um, no, we're, we're kind of gonna take a cautious approach to when we do go back into the office, right? And we see how colleagues are working, how behaviors are changing. Then we'll think about what do we need to what do we need to change or do differently? We have about another 18 months before we start moving people into the new headquarter. The design is not gonna change dramatically. As I said, we, in order to accommodate um, some of the change, Microsoft's roadmap calls for now a large format room that would be more inclusive of remote participation. So we're gonna redesign the furnishings in those types of rooms to accommodate this new format that's, that's on the roadmap due out in the next you know, six to 12 months. Um, so that, that's a change that we're going to make. But I said we were pretty flexible in designing the spaces to begin with. And, and so I don't really see any whole scale uh, major design changes to the building. And from a technology perspective, we're always looking uh, at, at the, the next best tool that'll provide a better experience. But with mm -hmm. a project of this magnitude, we've got we to make purchases because we're, we're in a construction schedule, as you probably know, Raj. So, so we have to put the stake in the ground here very soon about the, uh, the tools we're going to declare and utilize. And I think we've done that pretty well. It should, it should accommodate um, you know, any, any fluctuation or, or changes in thinking. So. And I, I would just add to that, and KJ, correct me if I'm not 100% um, accurate on this, but, you know, Raj, there were a lot of decisions that they made, which kind of went against the grain of what, how, what, what people were used to doing and how they were used to doing it, right? So, for example, KJ, back then, there was a lot of pushback around the notion of pivoting from WebEx to Teams. Absolutely. There was a lot. But... But the team, you know, that, you know, when presented with the case, you know, we kind of put some things down that helped support the flexibility and the features and benefits that that might offer and how that was aligned with the business. And, you know, if you think about a decision like that, I would, I would suggest I, KJ, that that helped. Yeah, tired. After the tired. pandemic. I'm going to go for a walk after this webinar. It's Tom Bradbury. <laughs> Hi, Julie. 
<laughs> mute, mute. Whoops. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you. Uh, you know, timing is everything. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, how, how, yeah, with this pandemic, certainly, and, uh, um, you know, how you can use it to help the cause as well as, uh, uh, you know, reinforce uh, the plans is, uh, is interesting. So, I, I will just, and I'll, I'll just underscore, uh, uh, you know, obviously it's a, it's a great time to be a Pfizer colleague. A lot of pride around, um, you know, what we're able to deliver to benefit the world, right? Um, our leadership has really taken the time to consider us as people throughout this entire ordeal, right? Um, they're concerned about our safety, so they're not rushing anyone back to the office. Certainly those colleagues that are required to work in manufacturing or research, uh, the first consideration is how they can continue to do so safely, right? Um, and it's, it's just been great to see the response from leadership um, about us as colleagues. They provided us a stipend to make a better home setup if we needed to, uh, you know, do you need more peripherals, uh, et cetera. And they said, look, go get what you need so you can continue to work comfortably on Pfizer's behalf. So really very, very supportive and being very thoughtful now about how we bring people back. And again, this new thinking about the purpose of the workplace and, and uh, you know, don't managers, don't force your people to a four day work week in the office, et cetera. Let's be more flexible to accommodate different lifestyles and things like that. So it's, it's been great. It's, it's really been great to see the support we're getting from leadership. Great, thanks KJ. Thanks yep. Rajan, great question. Um, next up, I'd invite Marion Carter to uh, turn video on and, and audio and ask away. Hi, um, so I was just curious as far as um, you had mentioned, um, employees can log in for the day. Um, and I just wanted to know um, what kind of application or applications. I know, I think I have an idea of what Pfizer um, is currently um, using. I know you're using a, a lot of Tririga tools um, and also um, Microsoft. Um, so I was just wondering, are those tools working um, for you? Um, are you streamlining the tools? Um, how is it? How would it work with a flexible work arrangement? Because we're working with a lot of clients right now that are trying to understand, you know, how scheduling room scheduling systems would work with uh, like a flexible work arrangement. Yeah. So the the login for your day name is really a name only, right? It wasn't. It doesn't reflect any um, system or or uh, platform. Um, but we are in the process and we've been in the process of implementing the IBM reserve scheduling tool for some time. We're actually Monday, we're going live with the tool, despite the fact that most people are not back in the building, we, we are successfully gonna turn it on uh, for five or six locations. Uh, and then we'll continue to roll it out over the coming months. Um, so we are changing the scheduling tool. The Microsoft uh, suite of tools, you know, the Teams collaboration tools, that is probably been the, the biggest um, greatest success story for us thus far. We, we enabled a small contingent of colleagues, both in the digital organization and then um, some of the business colleagues who agreed to jump on and try out Teams AV. We were, we were a, predominantly a WebEx shop, as Tom mentioned. Uh, and I, you know, I love the WebEx tool. It's all we knew for a long time. It was very stable for us, but uh, the experience with Teams has been terrific and it caught on like wildfire and people were wanting to jump on, how do I get Teams AV? The single click to join or make a call or, or, or join a meeting was just really great for people. So now we, we sort of pivoted very quickly and turned it on for everybody, uh, the whole company. And, and, uh, and it's been great. And so now it's about making sure people understand the robustness of that tool and exploiting um, all the things that it can do for colleagues. Um, and that's about education, right? And, and, um, uh, you know, helping colleagues uh, on that journey. So, so is Reserve um, being used from a mobile perspective um, via a mobile tool or is it just the laptop? Uh, it's both. It'll be enabled mobily and on the laptop. We're also instituting this colleague companion app, as I referenced, for the new headquarter. We're going to pilot it in two new facilities that will actually open before the New York headquarter. And we'll be able to uh, integrate booking on that mobile app as well. And this concept of desk booking is a big topic right now, right? We're moving to an unassigned open plan scenario for our New York headquarter, which is brand new for colleagues. Um, and so the concept of should people be able to book a desk is really one that's up for discussion and debate right now. 
We're not really sure how it's going to go down. Our, our leadership, our workplace solutions leadership teams are discussing what their preferences are. Um, and so I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting where they're going to land. Thankfully, the technologies we have in place will accommodate um, desk booking, location booking, area booking. Uh, so I'm not worried about the technology supporting it. It's really about what policy we're going to put in place. One thing that I've seen, KJ, to that point is teams want to make sure when they go in, they can reserve an area where they'll all be sitting together. Um, otherwise, if it's yep. haphazard, you know, if it's five people, oh, what if we run the risk we can't find a place to be together? So uh, there are there are a couple of different schools of thought amongst our leaders as well. Some some of them say they love this idea of forcing cross collaboration that may not have occurred. If you are assigned to a neighborhood or an area, you're stuck with the same kind of people. But if you're not and you're forced to think outside the box, you might have uh, you, you know, new connections that lead to new innovations that may not have happened. So yeah, there's definitely differences in thinking. Um, again, we have some time to, uh, to think about the new headquarters, certainly with an 18, uh, 18 month sort of runway to get there. Um, and we're gonna start exploring these things uh, as we go back to the office in New York, trying to implement a more open plan little by little in the current headquarter. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Great, thanks. One more question. We, we're running down on time here. Um, Connie Van Ryn, if you can turn your um, camera on and audio. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, some of the questions have already been asked that, that I uh, was thinking about, but really to get very tactical, I think you've got a great plan in place. It sounds like you know, you're setting yourself up for success. And what you'll find out is obviously when the people do start to come back, what are the learnings? How are you set up probably a little differently than in prior budgets, that day two type of funding so that if you need to make some modifications more than you might've anticipated, I think that would become more important. And I'm curious your approach there. And, and also just any metrics you can share on terms of productivity and what the leadership has said, this is what you know. we think productivity looks like in, in a success. Um, Raj spoke a little to that, just a little deeper on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to that first because I don't really, I don't have the metrics, but let me, let me do some investigation and I'll certainly uh, try to find an answer for that question, Connie, and get that out to the, to the folks here on the call. Um, day two, funding, it's a, it's a great question. Um, we, we suffer a little bit from an, a fear of ownership advisor in some areas when it comes to these newer technologies. Um, and so I have to talk to many people <laughs> about what we're planning to do and deliver and implement and get a consensus on where ultimate ownership lies. Thankfully, the buck usually does stop with our global workplace solutions teams. And that's our real estate and facilities and operations teams that run all of our facilities worldwide. And they are, they are very well bought into what we are trying to achieve with a digital experience design. And um, they have funded us quite well for exploration and discovery. And they know that it's gonna continue you know, past move-in. And so we put forth a very robust budget that would accommodate further development. We had to put a stake in the ground for what we can deliver day one. One area that we will we will get much more heavily into is sort of this artificial intelligence, right? And 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 the, the use of AI beyond um, some of its current uh, uses at Pfizer. That's an area we 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 said, look, we can do some things for day one, but not a whole lot. We're only going to scratch the surface. So we need some money set aside for exploration, data analytics, and and sort of uh, predictive maintenance and all that kind of stuff for day two. So we have that bucket sitting out there. Um, but some of these other things we, we haven't really talked about. And again, it's gonna be a matter of collecting, uh, collecting the right bodies and, and, uh, and in some cases duking it out <laughs> and in others, uh, you know, just, just dipping into the money that we've already put aside. Great. Thank you. I, I think that that's, you know, it, as we move forward, I think that everyone's gonna to wanna to learn from you and some of the other companies that are really shifting to a new location and, and learnings along the way. And, I just think that you know having that forgiveness in terms of the pilots and having funding. I think you know anyone within going into a project now that's a filter will have to remember that there may be more wiggle room on the other side than, yeah. than what we would normally anticipate. 
We built a we built a test lab, a design test lab in our current headquarter. It's about five or six thousand square feet, where we we really tore down everything and built it like the new headquarter is going to look. And we are constantly bringing in the technologies that we expect to deliver, and allowing people to get in there and touch them and play with them and and recognize the behaviors and and the experience they will have. And already we've seen some things that we're going to change as a result of that. And uh, and I'm hoping. Uh, I'm hoping that will lead us to the right decisions and the right spending, uh, you know, down the road. It's right. like operationalizing things. Don't forget that. It's not just launch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, guys. Stephen, do you want to wrap things up? We've yeah, just very time. quickly. Um, thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, KJ. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great day. Good great. panel. Thank, thank you so much. Have a good one. Thanks, walk. everybody. Bye-bye.